Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations around money. I'm your host, Lauren, a four-time Olympian and certified financial planner. On this show, my guests share their money stories. Everyone has a unique story and experiences both wins and losses when it comes to money. My intent is to give listeners something they can relate to, something that builds their courage to be open and take control of their own money story. When I'm not creating a great show for my listeners, I'm running my company, Worth Winning, where I help individuals and families organize their finances. Check us out at worth-winning.com. All right, now on with the show. I want to take a moment to talk to the recent college grads. You know, the ones that graduated in May or June this past summer. You're probably enjoying the grace period on your student loans right now and started even maybe pretending that they don't exist. But that time is winding down. And trust me, you don't want to not have a plan in place when that time comes. They're going to kick you right to the standard payment. And you're going to be like, what? I can't pay this. Or maybe you've landed a really cool job and you can. But you've got options as it pertains to your student loans. And if you don't know what those options are, you should check out studentloanplanner.com so we can start a conversation about creating a repayment strategy for your student loans. Today, I'm excited to have Kwame Christian here to share his money memoir with us. Kwame is a business lawyer, but as an entrepreneur, he started American Negotiation Institute, where he puts on workshops designed to make difficult conversations easier. With his background in psychology and public policy, along with his law degree, he brings a unique voice to the discussion of conflict management and negotiation. He also has a podcast called Negotiate Anything, where he discusses exactly that, how to negotiate everything. And if that's not enough, he also has a TEDx talk called Finding Confidence in Conflict. Yes, I know you guys are excited to listen to Kwame today, right? So today, Kwame and I talk about that moment when money got real. He shares the reason why he transitioned from his law firm to putting on workshops and how him and his wife are handling their finances together. Last but not least, Kwame shares a little about his passion, negotiation. Let's listen as Kwame shares his money memoir. Kwame, thanks so much for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me, Lauren. All right. Let's get started by letting the people know a little bit more about you. So why don't you tell us where you're from, how you grew up, and tell us about your first memory of money. Oh, very interesting question. So my name is Kwame Christian. I am a business lawyer and the director of the American Negotiation Institute, and I put on workshops that help make difficult conversations easier for professionals around the country. I grew up in a small town called Tiffin, Ohio, and it was an interesting upbringing because it's rural Ohio. So there wasn't very much diversity. The joke I used to say was that there were four black people in Tiffin, me, my mom, my dad, my brother. (laughs) And it made for a very interesting upbringing because on top of that, I had a really strong Caribbean accent. So it made me extra different. And so what's interesting is because of that experience, I really learned at a young age how to connect with people of different backgrounds, even though They might be different from me, or I might be different from them, or they might feel threatened by me. And so I think that served me well now as a professional. When it comes to my first real memory of money, that's a tough one, really, because thankfully I I had a situation where my mom and my dad, they both worked. My mom was a college professor in nutrition, and my dad was a surgeon. So money wasn't really an issue. I guess the first time I became aware of it was when I would try to make money as a young kid in the neighborhood. I remember we had a bunch of fruit trees in the backyard. And so I would pick the fruit and try to sell it to our neighbors, things like that. I would shovel snow, try to make a little bit of extra money. So I think at a young age, that entrepreneurial vibe was deep in my blood. And I think it's probably because of the Caribbean background. We can't just have one job. (laughs) (laughs) have to have two or three. (laughs) There's definitely that perception that the people from the Caribbean are Hard workers, to say the least. That's right. So tell us a little bit about what it was like in your household. Was there an allowance, a piggy bank? Was money being talked about, even though it wasn't necessarily an issue? Were you the spender and your brother the saver or the opposite way around? 
Yeah, it was the opposite with me and my brother. So I have a younger brother, three years younger. He would be more willing to spend money than I was. This never really was a focus on me. I was never really about things, never big on receiving gifts and things of that nature. We didn't have an allowance and really whatever we needed was provided. And I guess on holidays or birthdays, you get special gifts. But my family wasn't really ever very materialistic. I would say the only person in the family who came close to being materialistic was dad, simply because he enjoyed getting little gadgets. He liked technology. So he always wanted the newest thing. And so he didn't really care too much about the finances in the sense that he was concerned about bringing it in. He had his own practice and he would take care of his employees and everything. But beyond that, when it came to personal spending, it never really was a focus. But now that they're older, that's one of mom's biggest complaints and biggest regret was that they never really spend enough time investing and being smart with their money and saving. So now they have to kind of work later in life than they would have liked. And so you were just saying that your father enjoyed bringing the money home, but there was never really a plan for it. Do either of the influences of your parents that you remember, have they manifested themselves in your life later on? Like now that you're older, looking back, are there any similarities? Lauren, <laughs> it's not until I just said that that I realized, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm my dad. <laughs> oh my gosh. See how I led you? <laughs> yes, that's creepy. Oh, that's so weird. Yeah. The joke I always say is when it comes to leaders, there are wartime leaders and peacetime leaders. And a wartime leader goes into war, they fight, they bring back a new territory and new riches for the country. And then once peace has been achieved, you need a peacetime leader to actually manage the wealth. I realized I'm a wartime leader. I like to bring in money. That's fun for me. I like doing that. But once it's in, I don't really care. That's why um, Whitney, my wife, is the CFO. She handles the finances. If she wants to save or put the money in different places, she'll do that. If she needs more money for my business, she'll ask for it. I'll give it to her. But when it comes to spending, though, I think that's where me and my father differ because dad was a big spender when it came to these little knickknacks and gadgets. I'm a minimalist, so I like fewer things than more things. So it ends up just sitting around for the most part, not doing anything. My money just sits there bored most of the time. That's really interesting. I mean, so frequently we can connect our habits as adults to things we experience in our environment and, and particularly in our household as it pertains to our money behavior. So be able to connect those two things, but see how you're doing it also differently. Sometimes we see those things and we say, I want to do the exact opposite of it. We see part of it manifest itself and the other parts not. So I think you talked about a little bit of both of that and that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So were these parents strict parents and what kind of conversations were being held in the household? Like you said, you're seeing now that they didn't save in the way that they had intended to and they're working a little bit longer. Were there conversations between you and your brother and your mother and father about money or was that kind of like their business and your business was to be kids and shut up and be taken care of? Yeah, well, as far as being strict, I don't know a Caribbean household that isn't strict. So they were definitely <laughs> disciplinarians. More so than me, you know, with my son, he's going to be three. I'm willing to negotiate. I want to foster those tenets of dispute resolution and effective communication at an early age. There was no negotiation (laughs) with Caribbean (laughs) parents, like none at all. But I think that served us well when it comes to discipline and restraint and all those things now, character building type of things in adulthood. So it, it worked. But with regard to conversations about money, yes and no. I would say that sometimes, again, it would be. We would talk about where the opportunity was with regard to money for the family. Eventually, mom made the decision to join dad's practice and be the manager of the practice. So it was a family business. So dad was the surgeon running the practice, and then we had some employees. So mom was always managing the finances at the office and in the home. So usually when they were having conversations about money, it was mom talking about spending and costs and those type of things. She was very cognizant of those things. And she still is. But from dad, really not too much a talk about money. I think really with our family, it was kind of assumed that you're going to go to school, you're going to get an education, you're going to get a decent job or whatever it is you plan on doing. So there was never really talk or fear of a situation where we would be struggling uh, significantly financially. So I guess because we were beyond that point of struggle, 
I guess maybe they didn't feel like it was too big of a deal to talk to us about it. But mom definitely made more of an effort to do it. But as young bucks, we often <laughs> often ignored her, her sage advice. Ah, a kid that ignored their parents' advice. Never heard of one of those before. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you said you were entrepreneurial as a child. What did it look like kind of that 16 high school age where you're able to work? Did you have to get a job immediately? Did you want to get a job immediately? Did they tell you you need to get a job? Or you talked about education being the focus. So maybe you didn't have to get a job because you were focused on education. Tell us what happened there. Yeah, it was more the latter. So they didn't make me get a job, thankfully. And I say thankfully because I played a lot of sports. So in a small town like that, my parents wanted to make sure I was occupied. We were required to play a sport every season. And even in the spring, spring was particularly tough because my two favorite sports were during the spring, track and tennis. I played tennis longer, so I would do both sports. So I was a dual sport athlete in the spring, but I would always need to pick one for, for conflict. So it was always tennis. So when it got late in the season and track and tennis had regional or states or whatever, I always had to choose tennis. So there's always a piece of me that's wondering, like, I wonder what I could have been if I just stuck with track. But, you know, it's all good. It all works out. But yeah, I didn't have to get a job. It was just mainly making sure that my time was occupied. Okay. So you didn't have to get a job. You had to maybe probably get some good grades because you said education was important. So what was this like education, the next level looking like? Was there college savings? Was it, you got to make sure you're ready for these scholarships? What happened after your high school? So I'm a first generation American. So I was part of the first wave to go to American college from undergrad. So they didn't really know too much about the landscape with regards to scholarships and that stuff. Thankfully, they were able to pay for our education, at least the undergraduate portion of our education out of pocket, which is nice going into law school without debt, but law school quickly erased that advantage when it came to going into debt. But (laughs) but yeah, in school too, I did get jobs because I went to Ohio State and they are pretty good at pretty much everything. So I I wasn't going to be a D1 athlete. They cheat in football sometimes though. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's, that's what you call fake news, my friend. We don't cheat. This is your money memoir, so I'm not going to steal your shine, but... I have to stick with my Buckeyes. But yeah, I just cheered from the stands, which meant that I had to get a job. I did a front desk type of jobs, working all sorts of odd hours doing that. I was a psychology tutor. So after I went through and did well in my psychology classes, I tutored other students in psychology. Oh, yeah, I remember I was a page in the state senate. So I was working in the office of one of the state senators. So that was a good opportunity, too. Yeah, that sounds pretty dope. Does anything stand out to you about how you were managing your finances in that moment? Was it sort of similar to the way you describe yourself now? Yeah. You know, it's as you said that, I was like, oh, this question is coming and I have no idea <laughs> what to say. <laughs> because the money that I made, I don't even know where it went. I didn't spend it on stuff because undergrad was handled by my parents. So housing, all that stuff was taken care of by my parents. So I don't even know really what that went into other than building character. And I wasn't really a big spender. So I wasn't just buying frivolous things. So maybe at some point it went into my housing or things of that nature, but I really don't even know where that money went. So I guess that is kind of indicative of of how I thought about money. It's like, okay, you make it, period. (laughs) And that's it. Right. That's really strange. It is interesting that There's not a clear memory, but it's like, I know that I didn't do anything super crazy because usually when there's like a bad memory, it's like, oh, girl, let me tell you about this time that so-and-so happened. So no news is good news sort of is the way it was happening for you. I guess, but it has to go somewhere. Maybe that's what I used to buy my books. Maybe that's what I used to buy my books and things like that and pay for gas once I got a car and that kind of stuff. So those smaller expenses, it is very strange to think that I know I made money in undergrad, but I have no idea where it went. It had to go somewhere. It's not with me now. This is becoming an interesting therapy session, Lauren. (laughs) You're the one with the psychology degree, not me. I know. I'm just asking some questions. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So is there a point that you remember where you feel like you had control over your money? When you first 
became aware of it or did it ever become like, ah, money is now valuable to me? Maybe what happened right after college, that first time you had to go out and look for a job and trying to figure out life and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Yes, I do know the answer to this one because it wasn't even law school. Because undergrad happened and then went into law school. I had a job helping with an internship program, which paid the bills, which helped me to survive the summer before law school. We had enough, so it wasn't really a big concern. Then law school, with law school debt and with my wife's med school debt, it's hard for you at that time, and especially at that age, because we were, what, 21, 22, uh, to really fathom what was happening to us (laughs) financially. (laughs) So it's like, oh, sweet, I have a scholarship, which is great. And then I have tuition, but don't worry, loans are taking care of it. That's great. I have all this free money. Life is good. <laughs> and so then I, in the summer, I got a job working at a law firm, which was awesome because the first year they paid actual lawyer salary for those months that you were there. And like I said, I lived really frugally. So like, what do I do with this money? Again, where did that go? I don't know. Because I wasn't spending it frivolously. I don't know where it went. Actually, no, I have an idea because I was starting an online business at the time. So I probably invested a significant portion there. But when money really started to get real was when I graduated law school and I passed the bar exam and I had my first job and I was working in a social justice research institute doing presentations on implicit bias and things like that. And I wasn't making very much money at the time when he was still in school. And like I said, I'm very chill with my finances. So I knew eventually the loan man was going to come get me. And I was like, all right, I'll deal with that when it, <laughs> when it happens. Bring <laughs> it on. I'm not scared. How bad could it be? And so people would tell me, hey, you should get income-based reimbursement because you're doing social justice work. There's not a lot of money. So you should probably think about it. I'm like, yeah, they'll find me. Oh, and they found me, Lauren. Ooh. They found me. I remember it was in uh, November of 2013. And they're like, all right, so your first loan payment is going to be $800 for this month. I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) Where's that going to come from? I'm going to die. And so I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I remember in a two-week span, I lost 10 pounds. I was like, I need to make cuts somewhere. I'm I'm not going to eat anymore. That's it. (laughs) That's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to just give up food altogether. (laughs) Something needs to change. Yeah, after that first month, I definitely changed it and, and got it adjusted for what my income really was. And that's when I realized, wow, I'm a real adult now. Uh, <laughs> I need to start paying attention to this. Yes, I think the student loan game is what kind of brings it home for everyone. And no thanks to deferment or forbearance. You know, some people still continue to put their fingers in their ears and say, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to deal with this. So. It's good to know that, like you said, when it finally kicked in, that you did do something to change the situation in that moment so that it became manageable for you. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it was a big wake up call, but a necessary one. And I think it's those types of experiences that have a long lasting effect on you when it comes to, to managing finances. I wish I was one of those people who could just take advice and say, huh, that makes sense for me. Let me do that. But there's a big part of me that needs to feel it first. Like, uh, you know, that sounds reasonable. Let's see if it's true. (laughs) (laughs) That came back to bite me that day. All right. One of those, don't touch that. It's hot. Don't touch it. I told you it's hot. And then you got to put your hand directly on the stove to to make sure you know it's hot. And you're like, oh, okay. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's go a little bit further into the present day now. Sounds like your wife has been very important in helping you keep your finances organized. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship there and how you guys are having discussions around money, how you want to talk to your children about money and what is the financial entourage and the strategy that you're using right now? Right. And so right now with Whitney, again, she's kind of the voice of reason. She says what we need and I try my best to bring it. The the thing that's tough about my situation is that as an entrepreneur, month to month, you never know what you're going to make. Some months it could be great. Some months it's not so great. And so you have to try to kind of ride that wave. And so especially now with a child, having the three-year-old, I've gotten a lot less leeway than I used to when it comes to the financial side. But she's really good at keeping me in line in that regard, which is good. So really, when it comes down to it, it's managing the money that she brings in 
consistently and then we're kind of riding the wave when it comes to what I'm bringing in. And so that can vary wildly month to month. But what's been good is of late, now that I'm focusing more on doing presentations, I can look at a calendar and say, okay, I have one or two presentations this month. So I know in this month, that's what I'm going to bring in. And that's not counting the work that I do as a mediator. And I still have my law firm open. And so every once in a while, I still get business clients and clients that need help with estate planning. And I service them in that way too. So the speaking engagements have been a real godsend when it comes to predictability of income, because now I can actually look month to month and see what it could be like. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. And so entrepreneurial life is something that a lot of us have embarked on and the journey is different for everybody. You said speaking, you talked about mediation, you're an attorney, you have a law firm, like there's kind of like you're wearing lots of hats there. And I'm all about diversifying the streams of income coming in. Kind of tell us a little bit more about what your main thing is and what you're doing to grow that business. Yeah, it sounds like a very Caribbean approach, doesn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Because for a while, the main thing was the law firm. But to be honest, I don't really enjoy practicing law that much. It's not my favorite thing to do. And so at this point, what I'm doing is I'm scaling back on the law side and just focusing exclusively on marketing the American Negotiation Institute and the trainings. So if a client comes in via word of mouth, so they need help with something and they ask a friend, hey, here's Kwame, cool, I'll do that. But I'm not seeking out those clients. So it gets me a good couple thousand dollars per month, which is nice. And then now I'm picking up more mediation gigs because with mediation, I collect stories (laughs) essentially for the podcast and for the training because it puts me in a unique situation where I am not on one side, not on the other side. I'm directly in the middle of the conflict. And so I can see things that the other person can't see. So there's some confidential things on one side that come to light in our conversations that they don't want me to tell the other side. So I can see the deal very differently. And so it is more in line with the work that I'm doing. So I'm picking up more of those mediation opportunities and it provides a more consistent income because again, that's scheduled. And then the real thing that I'm focusing on the most is the uh, presentation. Because first of all, that's so much fun. (laughs) It's so much fun for me. (laughs) It's like, wait a second, you're going to pay for me to travel to this cool location, put me in a hotel, come and talk to you for a few hours about things I really, really like, and then fly me out. That's my job. Cool. I can do that. (laughs) (laughs) So I like that. And the thing that gives the highest rate of return, especially for the amount of time invested in it. There's, of course, a lot of time on the back end when it comes to education and experience that goes into it. But now, if there was nothing else, if there was no law firm and no mediation, if I just had one speaking engagement per month, it would not be that bad. So um, really focusing in heavily on the thing that gives me the highest rate of return has been paying dividends the last couple of months. I love it. I love it. Because so often as entrepreneurs, like you said, we got to pick up a side hustle. We've got these different things going on. And as millennials in general, we're all about, like you said, having multiple streams of income. But it's like, where is this thing that's going to be the breadwinner for me? Let me prioritize that thing. And let me be able to scale that thing so that I can get the biggest return on investment there. Yeah. And I tell you, just simplifying the process has been helpful because when I ask myself these few questions, it became really clear what I needed to do. And I've been at this for almost two and a half years with the negotiation side, trying to figure out what I could do. So before I was saying, I do coaching, consulting, and training. So three things. The average person doesn't know what a negotiation coach or consultant would do. Just, yeah, it's like, what does that mean? And training was at the end. And so I was like, all right, I think maybe I'm confusing people (laughs) by telling them I do too many things. And then when I thought about it, the thing that gives me the biggest return on investment is the speaking engagement. And that's the thing that people come to me the most for as well. So I just dropped everything else from the website. I didn't say anything about consulting, didn't say anything about coaching. I just said workshops. I go into companies and do workshops. And within two weeks of doing that, it was very clear night and day, the response I was getting. And so it just simplifying that and focusing on the thing that gives you the most money has been really, really helpful for me. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I love your job too, mediating and negotiating and the 
Institute uh, all around negotiation. Can you give us some tips? I know a lot of listeners out there are always trying to figure out how to have that conversation on how to get more money. And I think it's one of those things that could be more powerful if you could actually figure out how do I have that conversation about how to get more money? Right. I think the first thing we have to recognize is what a negotiation is and where it is, because I think that's one of the biggest areas where people are missing out because they don't know what a negotiation is. So a negotiation is any conversation where somebody in the conversation wants something. And it's an intentionally broad definition because I want people to recognize that negotiations are everywhere, whether it's with a spouse, a colleague, a boss, whatever, all of these interactions are negotiations. And so when it comes to, especially when, since we're on a show on personal finance, let's talk about the finances. Let's talk about the biggest source of income for most people, which is your salary. Or if you're an entrepreneur, the, the money you get from your clients, all of those things are negotiable. That's why the name of the podcast is Negotiate Anything. Because I want people to go in with the mentality that everything is on the table. You can at least ask. And if it doesn't work out, they can say no. And so I have a few episodes on the podcast geared toward how you can make the most out of your salary negotiation. But really, when you think about it, again, going back to return on investment, your salary as an employee, if you're employed by somebody else, negotiating your salary is one of the few times you have the opportunity to work at a rate of thousands of dollars per minute per minute. Because think about it, if you have a five minute conversation and you negotiate 5,000 extra dollars per year, that's pretty significant. That's a good work day. Five minutes and I got $5,000 per year for doing the exact same work. The thing is the money's out there. You just need to ask for it and then create a strategy to get it and you can get it. And then do something responsible with it when you get it, right? (laughs) Exactly. That's the second half. (laughs) And speaking of which, like, what about expenses? I mean, there's so many things that I think of, you know, the cable bill, like you can negotiate those things as well. Are there other expenses that you can think of in life that are negotiable? Yeah. So think of any time money leaves your bank account and use that as an opportunity to at least try. I believe in something called rejection therapy, where a lot of times people's biggest fear is asking like, oh, I don't want to offend them. Maybe I'll sound weird, blah, blah, blah. So I want people to ask for the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> so you could at least get the practice of asking and feeling that sting of rejection and recognizing that there's life on the other side. So when it comes to your cable bill, your phone bill, rent, all of those are on the table. If you're getting a car repair, especially, those type of things can be significant. The bigger the number, the more wiggle room there is to negotiate. And when we're talking smaller things, you're not going to really be able to negotiate the price of Skittles <laughs> or something like that. But if you have a car repair that's $2,000, you can negotiate 10% off of that. $200, that's significant. That's an Xbox (laughs) or that's a responsible (laughs) investment. Right. A responsible investment. I like that answer. (laughs) Whatever, however you want to look at it. (laughs) But yeah, the way you see it is there's money just sitting out there on the table. You just need to be willing to take the steps to just reach out your hand and grab it. I completely agree. And then once you grab it, you should do something responsible with it. I'm not on a soapbox or anything, though. Responsible is an open-ended word. You know, what's responsible could be for some person different than for others, right? Exactly. Think about what's the responsible thing to do with this new money that I've brought in and I've grabbed. It's not bonus money. I think frequently you get your year-end bonus, you get your tax return, and you're like, this is extra money. It's free money because you weren't really planning on it. So don't get your new raise and say it's free money because you spent that five minutes and got the $5,000. But think about how can I take this and use it for my future? What are my goals? What are the things that I could do with this money above and beyond thinking of it as quote unquote free money and having a good time with it and then kind of being back at square one? Exactly. And I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs falling into that trap as well because we say, oh, it's a business expense. So we act like it's free. It's like, oh, I'm going to buy this. It's a business expense. It's like, no, I mean, now it's not taxable income, which is great, but it's still money leaving your pocket. Yes, preach, preacher, because I frequently hear that. It's like, oh, don't worry, I'll get it. You know, it's a business expense. Everybody's going to throw their card on the table when it's time to eat. And you're like, oh, like these free meals, this is great. But I don't know if this is really the responsible thing in the long term because revenue minus expenses, like where's going to be the profit? All you got is a bazillion expenses. Exactly. Exactly. It might make you look cool in the short term. Um, And a good meal can't pay the rent at the end of the day. So (laughs) that's right. 
All right, Kwame, it has been wonderful chatting with you. We are getting close to the finish line. We are getting ready to do what I like to call the final sprint. Are you ready? I am ready. I'm going to rapid fire some questions at you. You got $20 in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) I would spend it on an assistant who will get me the names of key people within organizations so I could reach out to them and pitch them on a program. You're going to do all that on $20? Golly, you must be using Fiverr or something. Exactly. (laughs) I outsource. I outsource everything. Right, right. (laughs) All right, finish this sentence. That awkward financial moment when? You realize you have no money. Ooh, you just get ready to swipe your card. Uh, Declined, no? Yep. (laughs) (laughs) All right, the best advice you've ever received? Fail faster. Fail faster, I like it. Worst advice you've ever received? Don't fail. (laughs) That is bad advice. How can you learn anything if you don't fail, right? Exactly. Worst money habit? Yeah, it has to be just not paying attention to the amount of money I have in my bank account. Okay, but what's your best money habit? (laughs) It's becoming making money. That's why I'm speaking that into existence. But yeah, I think the best money habit for me right now is the orientation towards profit. And I think that's a key distinction, revenue versus profit. Because again, that's another lesson that entrepreneurs have to make. Because if you're making a lot of money, but your margins are like 5%, then really the amount of money that goes into your pocket is not that great. I have clients that are million dollar companies on the law side, but the money that they bring in really isn't that impressive given the size of their business because they're running at, uh, at an inefficient level. So focusing on profit is a habit I picked up. I love it. I love it. All right. Last but not least, can you share with us one thing that you would like to improve about your finances in the upcoming year? Yeah, it will be making sensible investments. Next year, I want to be more cognizant about investments in things like real estate and different stocks and things of that nature. So just finding unique ways to make my money work for me after I make my money. All right. So what's the action item that's going to help you reach that goal? This turned into a coaching session. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Really, as I was talking, thinking about this uh, throughout the conversation, I think the best action item for me would be to, once I get the money, hide it from myself. So I put it in a bank account that no card is attached to. So I allocate a certain amount toward investments and allocate a certain amount toward taxes so I don't have to have a freak out session come April. Because you don't want to owe Uncle Sam, that's for sure. No, he'll find you. All right, we have made it to the finish line. You are a pretty good sprinter. I'm going to give you a 10.99. That's a pretty fast time for a guy. Who's what, not been- what was your best time? 10.8. Yeah, I beat you. Don't worry. Um, (laughs) (laughs) all right but you're standing on top of the podium this is the race that you were in and i was not in so you won the race you're on the podium this is your time to shine tell us all about how we can find you how we can support you what you're working on now have your moment yes so the big thing for me right now is the book so i'm working on a book it's called finding confidence in conflict that's the tagline but the actual name is called Nobody Will Play With Me. So it's a book on negotiation, but more so on the psychology behind what makes difficult conversations so difficult and how we can improve our confidence and perform better in difficult conversations. So that's the big project that I'm working on. But until then, you can check me out on my podcast, Negotiate Anything, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Everybody who connects with me on LinkedIn gets a personal message from me, which is becoming increasingly difficult to do. (laughs) But I made the promise to my audience and everybody that I'll do it. They can do it. So you'll get a message eventually. All right. The most popular man on LinkedIn. And it's the real Kwame behind those messages, people. All right, Kwame, thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed listening to Kwame's Money Memoir. I think Kwame brought up some real great points. He shared how ignoring his student loan debt was not a great idea because it caught up with him in a big way. He also shared with us how he actually grew his business by reducing the amount of services that he marketed on his website. Have you ever heard the saying, less is more? Our word of the day today, 
you guessed it, negotiation. This is one of Kwame's passion, and he describes it as any conversation where a person in the conversation wants something. When it comes to your finances, it's important to remember that you can negotiate. You can negotiate to increase your salary or to decrease your monthly expenses. And remember, it never hurts to ask. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you found this episode worth listening to. If you have questions, suggestions for guests, or would like to share your own money memoir, please contact us through our website, worth-listening.com.